Good morning, Year 11. Uh, today I'm going to be going through the biomedical um, book. I'm going to be going through this fairly quickly. The thing that I'm most interested in focusing on once I've done my summaries is biomedical ethics. I think I've already talked about this to some extent in my video, so let's see if that comes up. It did come up. Okay. So, um, I do talk about the ethics. It starts with this guy who talks about how he got his son's cochlea removed. Um, this guy here. Fun video for you to watch that starts at 28 minutes. Um, this video and the one I'm recording now are going to be very similar. Uh, I guess this one is going to be focused a little bit more on talking about... Um, the course and what we're um, and the syllabus. So uh, closing this down, and we're going to bring up this video instead, and I'm going to have the syllabus next to us so that we can go through this together. Uh, Okay, can we make this zoom a little bit less, 75 maybe. Okay, that's perfect. It's maybe a little bit hard to see, but it will do. So, as always, um, the chapters are built into more or less five sections, so four sections, but there's some that I, I lump together, right? So we have scope of the profession. Um, can I just bring this across? That'd be nice. Okay, thanks. Okay, so the scope of the profession and historical influences, I basically consider to be the same thing. We've got engineering mechanics, which I often include electronics and lump those things together, but it doesn't really matter. Um, when I'm just putting the work in together in, in, in this assignment, when I, I give that the letter X, because it's usually calculations. It depends, Ohm's law I'd call X, and the, the stuff on like microcircuits I'd call M. Materials and then communications. Now, a lot of this stuff we have already somewhat done, which is shown by the uh, you know the colored mark, you know, the color codings I've got on these things. So let's have a look. The first of all, the nature and scope of the biomedical in, in um, nature and scope of the profession. Let's have a look at what that looks like in the textbook. Uh, Copeland doesn't go into that in huge amounts of details, but it talks about so what do biomedical engineers do? Well, in this video here, I actually go back to my slides from the start of the year and I go through and talk about it specifically. But the simple answer is that biomedical engineers solve um, find solutions to medical problems. That's a very, very succinct definition, but it will do, it will do for us. And so what they do is they work on, they develop and implement technologies to improve. Uh, I talk about this four main, four main domains that we work in. Uh, let me see if I have a picture of that in here. When I classify these things, I like to talk about the four main domains that, um, if I see if I can remember them while I'm talking, but we have things like, I usually do it on the board, and that's hard when I'm not in class to, to do things um, on the board. It'd be good, uh, by the way, I said earlier in the comments, it really does help people, uh, help me if you, um, if you give me the occasional comment because it makes me know that I'm actually streaming properly and that I'm not streaming the wrong thing, like some uh, just before I was streaming year 11 content for year 12s. Um, so, that was the picture I thought it was gonna be, but that's more on titanium. Okay, without having the picture on the board that I would normally talk uh, talk through, I'll just say here, there's four main areas that we will talk about off the top of my head. We have diagnostic devices, which is things like everything from a stethoscope to an MRI machine. They're machines that help us to understand what's going on. So that's the first domain of biomedical engineering. Then the second one is assistive devices. So this is everything from like a prosthetic arm to a self-driving wheelchair and everything in between. So things that make your life easier. It could even be things like medical robots. Um, you could even say like surgical assistive devices, kind of a 
they're, they're somewhere in between what with the next section, which is treatments. So treatments are everything from like laparoscopic surgery, so keyhole surgery, lapro the, it comes from the Greek word for like flank or side because they come in from the side. Um, so yeah, treatments could be anything from the way that we give people penicillin, radiotherapy, um, yeah, surg uh, surgery techniques, those sorts of things would be what I would, I mean, even the syringe, for instance, I would say is a treatment device. And so we've had, we just, just to go back from the beginning, we had diagnostic, we had assistive, we had treatment. And then there's a, a category which I call like prosthesis. So, um, or prosthetics. So this is things like um, replacement arms, but also it could be replacement organs. So like a prosthetic or an artificial heart or things like stents, things that go inside the body or replace the body. There would be the, um, that would be the four main areas I talk about. There are some things that are interesting like um, glasses. I guess I would call glasses an assistive device. And that's really no longer considered necessarily an aspect of biomedical engin uh, engineering just because it's, it's so well um, established as part of uh, another field of optometry. But it is uh, like once upon a time, the glasses would have been revolutionary. I, I wear glasses, so um, definitely have a huge impact on my life. And other areas like pharmaceuticals, we generally don't consider part of um, biomedical innovation, but I will talk about that when we talk about things like e ethics. So when we talk about things like EpiPens, I mean, EpiPens are a, a syringe, a spring-loaded syringe that um, dis distributes um, adrenaline, right? Or ephedrine. I, I, I don't remember how you, how you pronounce the other name for it, but effectively it's um, an, an adrenaline uh, injector. But things like um, if we make a, a tablet or a vaccine, for instance, those things still need to be distributed by, uh, they need to be produced and distributed by engineers. So things like Pfizer, which really needs to be carefully, um, the Pfizer COVID vaccine needs to be carefully distributed because it needs to be sent at very, very cold temperatures, in my understanding anyway, that that's a, a real engineering challenge. So the point is that the, the, the scope can be quite broad and I can include, include quite a few things in here which are maybe adjacent to biomedical innovation, but um, it's, if someone said to me glasses as, you know, development of glasses, it's not really something that we would say is really an engineering task anymore. Uh, but I think that historically it was an engineering um, innovation. Okay, so what, that's the nature of the, the project, uh, the nature of what engineers do. You're going to conduct research in the form of your uh, engineering report. Now, it, it identify health and safety issues. Oh, okay, well, just to keep co going along at the same time, we're going to go with um, current health pro uh, current projects. So I've got three main projects, artificial hearts, the bionic ear, artificial limbs, and joints. So they're three big um, areas. I really like the self-driving wheelchairs just because there's a guy called, um, I think I talk about him in this video here, um, Jordan Nguyen. He was developing with UTS these self-driving wheelchairs and um, pretty amazing. Uh, they sort of, he now works for Google, I think in the, the Google self-driving cars field, but uh, I don't know, you know if, he's, if that work is still continuing on with other people. Um, I'm not sure what's going on here, but anyway, oh, that's prosthetic arms. There's a video on that. Uh, this is all the ethics stuff and then into levers. Doesn't look like I talk about that here, which is surprising, the Jordan Nguyen part, but um, I'll definitely have links to it later. Okay, so uh, health and safety matters. Well. We have to be careful that when we're using things like radioactive isotopes for radiotherapy, that we need to provide that in such a way that it doesn't pre create a risk to people. That's um, a real consideration. Also, you could be um, in the field exposed to disease. So that's a, a consideration that care must be taken. They haven't gone into a lot of detail there. We, and I'm, I'm not plan You'll notice at the start, I talk about these things in a lot more detail and then I start hand waving a little as we get further down. But that's just for the first part. We're not going to a heap of depth in the book. And we will come back to this, but not in a great great amount of depth. Okay, training for the profession. We just look at which unis offer biomedical. So 
I think the big three in the city, so UNSW, Sydney and UTS all offer um, biomedical. My best student last year, she got a scholarship to do biomedical. Uh, I, one of my wife's friends, she did biomedical at New South um, and the student who took the scholarship, she was going to go to Sydney. So I'm pretty sure that that's offered at all three unis. It's worth talking about when we just jump to the next one, um, career prospects, that I'll just quickly mention here, um, I before we jump on, because I might not come back and say this in any great depth, I recently asked on Reddit um, for people who are aspiring bio, uh, biomedical engineers, what uh, sort of undergraduate subjects which should they do? Would you be better off doing chemistry or physics? And the argument is that probably both are important, um, or biology. So that they say most, you, you really can't do a engineering degree in Australia without doing physics at uni. That said, you only have to do one semester of um, physics at uni. Somehow I managed to jump it, but um, I think that was an incredibly rare case. Um, whereas if you're going to be a, when I looked at the course outline for UTS, that you have two choices you can do a very bio a biology heavy uh, course load or you can do a very um chemistry heavy load in particular a lot of a lot of work is with ceramics so that was one of the specific things that reddit mentioned okay uh, so you don't need to do medicine but you will get a lot of um something that's very specific to biomedical is that the, the technology is unique to this profession is there's a lot of consideration to the human body, which is you know, unique to biomedical engineers. Uh, career prospects, it's not the same volume of field for civil, mechanical, or electrical engineering. That said, we do have some interesting um, areas of points of differentiation, like so things like cochlear. The, they work out of Macquarie Uni. Um, they are a famous Australian company, the groundbreaking company in terms of what they do, and that has helped us. The problem is that in Australia, there is not a lot of money for research. Science generally is un very much underfunded in Australia compared to the rest of the world. So if you want to be a successful biomedical engineer, you're probably going to, um, you're gonna have to either work really, really hard or be willing to move overseas. Okay, relationship with the community is generally pretty positive. There are a few exceptions, like um, this video of the guy who had his son's cochlea removed. Right, uh, go back to this guy. Where is he? This guy, right? Um, so that is a consideration, right? That uh, the, the deaf community are not a fan of cochlear implants. I can go into that story in greater detail maybe later, but it's probably already in that video and um, hopefully I can talk about it in the classroom. Okay, ethics and engineering. So there's a couple of things that we talk about. I mean, I have something like 20 minutes of content where I go through a whole bunch of posts. Um, after the deaf guy, I talk about things like the price of the end of life, things like who, who we test vaccinations on, um, like do we test on animals, that sort of stuff. There's a whole bunch of other things like the cost of um, like price gouging. So whether or not, how much is it is a fair price to charge for things like vaccines? Okay, so that's what we can talk about when we get to ethics. Uh, that covers most of the things that we talk about. Okay, uh, engineers as managers. We talk about managers in um, in every aspect of, of engineering. There's always management that has um, engineers as managers in two sense of the word. They can be managers of the design and the implementation. So that's um, yep. Yeah. Okay. So historical background that starts with, you know, they talk about prosthesis, um, prosthetics from, uh, if we go back to, again, with this video, I'm, um, that I have the Roman Capua leg, which I think I talked about in our Zoom lessons just recently. Now, that's not to say that there weren't prosthetic legs prior to um, two and a half thousand years ago. They were just probably made out of wood or they were melted down by, by people afterwards in the case of bronze. Um, I'm sure I mentioned here, but in the 99% Invisible episode, they talk about the stethoscope and how the stethoscope was really the start of diagnostic um, medicine. Because prior to that, you really didn't have any idea of how you know, what was going on inside the person. 
then obviously things like x-rays <coughs> up to uh, MRIs. <coughs> so, uh, then we have specific products or that we're going to look at as case studies. So they really focus on uh, the total in the total artificial heart. Um, I do, I use as a funny example that at my old school, we used to watch this video on plastics in our lives. And it's really easy to hate plastics and talk about how people shouldn't be able to use straws. Now, <clears throat> it's funny, I'll use this example that a friend of mine, uh, it's really, I, I went to high school with a guy and I became friends with his brother who has cerebral palsy. And he struggles to drink out of a cup. So he really needs plastic plastic spoons, sorry, plastic straws. Um, for you and me, uh, you know, maybe a straw is a convenience. For most people, they don't care at all. So it's very easy to ban something that doesn't matter to you. But for this guy, plastic straws are how he consumes liquid. He really uh, has struggled with a whole bunch of alternatives and, um, you know, like metal straws that he would, he would keep um, when he tried to drink out of a metal straw that he would uh, cut the roof of his mouth and it was really distressing for him that he was going to lose something that he needs to get by and when we used to watch this video plastics in our lives they talked about how the total artificial heart just can completely revolutionize the lives of the the people who use them prior to this you the best you could have is um tubes coming out of your body to something that pumped blood through your body in the size of a mini fridge Whereas having it be totally internal means that um, there's less points for infection and you don't have to carry around a mini fridge. And I used to use the example of imagine if you want to go on a date and you say, oh, look, I'm sorry, but I, I can't go anywhere that has stairs because I need to carry this mini fridge around with me. That's really going to uh, affect your ability to date someone who likes hiking. hiking. So I, I just try to use that as a, a you know, to, to give people an understanding of how important some of these innovations are that they really are life-changing for people okay so as we go into um, mechanics and hydraulics well we have we should now at this point be familiar with the three orders of levers number one of seesaws number two are wheelbarrows number three is uh, fishing rods we should also be familiar with mechanical advantage and velocity ratio and the concept of efficiency being mechanical advantage divided by velocity ratio. We looked at that with things like pulleys back in uh, chapter one, we looked at that pretty early. In this uh, subject, we don't talk too much about, um, the, the hard thing that we look at, the hardest thing we look at is these bikes. And there's a bike question in the, it's number tw number 10 in the chapter review questions. Um, there's this bike here, but, I would, um, that could be in a year 11 exam, but it would be a hard year 11 exam question. Um, that would definitely be the hardest question in the exam. Uh, we have a couple of things like that, but uh, that's that's probably the one for this subject. Okay, so um, the doctors that I know, when they did their med, med degree, they had to do biodynamics, where they learn about the human structure as a machine. So things like uh, why you don't wanna wear a bag over one shoulder, and why so some people have to wear like adjustments in their, their foot in their shoe if their leg is one leg is a little bit shorter than the other because these things can really have a, a cumulative effect and um i know two people who had end up having a lot of pain because their one leg was slightly shorter than the other okay so forming methods we've talked about forming and forging and uh, casting in class the, it's important to note that, so normally in class, I would actually show you some samples so you could see for yourself what this grain flow looks like. We'll look at some pictures on the internet, but it's not quite the same as being able to look at the uh, the samples yourself and see the, the grain flow. Um, we're gonna talk about why forging is better. And we use the example of a hip stem as being the, the sort of quintessential example. Uh, in casting, we've watched videos of um, grain formation before when we're doing things like annealing, we can talk, go back and look at that in a bit, but that's generally the idea. Um, it's important to note that in this document, the, the numbers are wrong. It's not the, the order is correct. It's just the numbering is wrong. So it's one, two, three. Um, we're going to look at the grain formation of casting, but we, we, we're not going to cover that today. 
and some impurities. Again, if we were in class, we have a whole bunch of ingots which we can look at and we can actually see, see the effect of this in uh, physical samples. Now, I have um, for casting, I have a whole video on casting. It has both year 11 and year 12 content. And I'm going to say now that, so my plan is to give you six hours to do your engineering report. Uh, HSE, the, um, to do your engineering report. So I'm going to give you two hours each week, which is a fairly big chunk of your lesson time. But um, I'm also still going to give you homework. So this will probably be next week's homework, which is to summarize uh, the different forms of casting. Now, 50 minutes, I'm pretty, it's been a lot of time on this video in particular. I, I really, um, I think I did a good job on that one. And it covers both year 11 and year 12 casting. I'm okay with teaching a little bit of year 12 content um, early, especially this close to the end of the course, the, the preliminary course. Okay, so then what we're going to get on to is uh, we, you'll notice that here that with like cutting, I don't really, we have to, we did talk about cutting in the chapter one of the book. Not a whole lot here on cutting, but um, I will, I will discuss that later. Um, okay, in terms of materials, when we talk about alloys, well, we have already covered all of our stainless steel and precipitation hardening. I will make you study titanium. So that will be what I'll probably make you do on in next, the week after next is do titanium. And we'll cover a little bit on polymers and ceramics used in, um, <clears throat> in biomedical fields. In terms of electronics, at this point, I have made you learn about all the electronics we've, we've done. We've learned about things like Ohm's law and we've learned about power equaling voltage or in this case, electromotive force times current, um, but PIV, PIE, however you want to write it. We've talked about that in some length already. And the thing that we haven't talked about is power sources. So things like batteries. Um, in terms of digital technology, we've talked a little bit about microcontrollers and uh, integrated circuits. That's something I'll go over in a little bit more detail. We've also talked about logic gates. So, XOR I don't think can be in the HSC. These two symbols are not actually shown. We have AND, NAND, or sorry, yeah, AND or NAND and NOR. Those four are in the HSC um, documentation. <clears throat> I would be very surprised to see these two, but it's probably worth knowing and doesn't hurt. Um, and so in this case, they're showing that a 7400 um, series IC, which is just made out of four NAND gates. And the idea is your, your brain is just a trillion NAND gates. <clears throat> um, each, each um, you have, <sighs> let me read this wrong. So, so we have a hundred trillion uh, synapses in, in your brain. Each one of those acting as a, um, that's just in the cerebral cortex. You actually have brain cells in your stomach, which is pretty crazy. We have more brain cells in our stomach than cats have in their heads. And cats are relatively smart animals. <clears throat> okay, so in terms of communication, we're now looking at section drawings, which I talked about in our last uh, long Zoom. I talked about how we, the sectioning rules. I think that these lines are a little dark. I think that, um, well, I mean, I can at least see a differentiation between this line and this line here, whereas there they look pretty, the line type look, weights look pretty similar. Uh, dimensioning is covered in um, in chapter two. We've gone through a lot of dimensioning in the last video. And if we look through here, we actually have to write an engineering report, which um, I have given, uh, I have already set for you. Uh, there's some specific things that we need to look at. Here they're talking about, um, Copeland likes the idea of um, the, art, the engineering report being on total artificial hearts. I've set it on um, hip replacements just because that's a, a, another good um, topic to look at. So that's our overview of the topic. The next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at um, ethical considerations. So.
Okay, um, I probably could have got this ready earlier, but I didn't, I didn't, so. Okay, um, with ethical considerations, so I've got quite a few here that I have listed. Um, I'm gonna focus on these side, the ones on the side. So I'm gonna try and, as I've already mentioned, I have, talked about these at some length in this video. I'm not sure how much this is going to overlap. I'm not in this video going to talk about... Many Magic the Gathering uh, so players ask the, the question, is it worth... About the nature okay. Okay. Um... <clears throat> so... I'm not going to go through the cochlear implant video um, here because I've already done that. Um, so I'm going to leave the cochlear implant and just focus on a few things. And I'm only going to go through these quickly because if you want to watch a you know me talk about by ethical considerations for 20 minutes, you can do that on this video. So um, what I'm going to say is that the key things that we're, we're concerned about when we talk about um, ethics. So, <clears throat> uh, it's interesting, there's some stuff that I can't show while I'm in class because they don't uh, don't allow Reddit. So I'll have a look at those. Um, so, there are people who are making prosthetic hands. Um, th this prosthetic hand is an open source prosthetic hand that anyone can use and the parts cost $30, right? Compared to if you watch the Catalyst video that I linked to where the, um, where his prosthetic arm costs $50. That's uh, right, that was, I think it was, um, I, not $50, I think it was, I don't remember if it was $500 or $50,000, but let's point, the point I'm gonna say is it was tens of thousands of dollars, if not more. Oh man, there's my uh, name on there. Anyway, um, Okay, so we talked about cochlear implants. People have been working on retinal implants. They are very difficult to make work, right? Um, retinal implants are very diff difficult to make work. So the, just the resolution that you can provide, the thing is the nerve endings have to go somewhere. And most blind people, their synapses have been rewired to things like sound and touch so that they, they're just nowhere in the brain where that information can go. Um, I mentioned in the other video, and I'll post a link to it, there's a great courses that talks about um, perception, <coughs> and they go into some of the details of this. Now, that, that, that's 10 or 20 years old now, so I'm mindful of that, you know, technology keeps improving all the time. But for the moment, uh, bionic eyes uh, appear to be much, much more of a challenge than um, bionic ears. Okay, so this looks like another open source bionic leg legs. Yeah. I am using that blocker. So that's what we've got here. Um, okay, so. Facebook is making AR glasses to help deaf people um, hear better. So something that's really important is that when your hearing starts to go, that you notice more and more that, and for people who have learnt languages, you might find that it's very hard to understand what people are saying when you can't lip it, look at their lips. That lips really do help you to put together a total picture. and. It's fine when your hearing is good and when you're really familiar with the, the, the spoken language. But when your hearing is not good or when, when it's an unfamiliar language, losing that ability to, to see lips makes a really big difference. And so Facebook, um, they were working on something to help people who um, have hearing, uh, hard, who are hard of hearing. Okay, so a cough detector. Now this would be a piece of diagnostic equipment that can identify um, COVID in 97% of people based on their cough. Um, so this is people 3D printing um, a cartilage. 
this is really more innovations than um, ethics. I, I meant to be, uh, there is some ethics in here, but I guess this is just where I post all of my biomedical stuff. So let's have a look at what we got. And this is probably not going to be stuff in that other video as well. So I'm happy to spend my time on this. Okay, so um, people who have uh, 3D printed wearable um, sensors, and the advantage for this is that you, um, it, it's not nearly as invasive. <clears throat> I don't seem to have the picture anymore. So, I mean, these days most people are wearing, you know, many people in, in our classes, are, I'm wearing a watch that tracks my heart rate. And um, these, um, yeah, a whole bunch of new sensor technology that can help people. Like, so things like socks that can tell if a diabetic is... Um, it can read their sweat and it can read their, their blood sugar level and help them to prevent them having um, a hypoglycemic shock. Uh, this was kind of interesting. Um, this is a gun that can be used to spray like a, um, a covering over a wound. Obviously you wouldn't use it in every application, but it has, um, it has you know, some applications, especially like for field, field applications, I think for burns. Um, yeah, anyway. And the thing is that this could eventually be the default that we start using for things because it's going to be a lot more flexible, a lot less um, uncomfortable than your typical um, bandage. Okay. Um, okay, so I mentioned before about the um, deaf community, right, that they are opposed to cochlear implants. So here we have a deaf person saying that a hearing parent doesn't know how to deal with their deaf baby and decides for their life for them without their knowledge or consent. Right now, I don't want to pick a fight with the deaf community. So I'm just going to let that one be a thing that you guys can discuss. Maybe we can have a uh, Zoom discussion on that where you guys can research that. Okay, so um, rather than having needles, right, um, micro needle patches, uh, a thing so it's, that would be yeah, a delivery device a, um, <sighs> okay so this is about the cost of um, the cost of it's important that people who work on medical innovations, either engineers or chemists or whatever, that, you know, med scientists, it's important that they get paid fairly for their work. Um, this, in this case, it's someone who's talking about how their insulin, you know, $800 worth of insulin um, didn't get put back in the fridge, which is lucky because if they didn't have $800, you know, they would die. Um, so then the comment is that the person who d discovered artificial um, insulin, right, this guy called Frederick Banting, he sold the patent for one dollar because it was so important that uh, everyone should have cheap access to insulin. Now, it, it is really interesting. The insulin debate is, is quite an interesting one in terms of that the companies, I mean, people blame the, especially in the US, the um, health insurance scheme there and i think health insurance is generally cons generally a bad thing i think that um i mentioned in other videos and i don't want to make too much of a point about socialist practices but you know someone like Anne rand who uh is very much about uh people should work hard no one chooses to be sick no one chooses to be a diabetic and that I think in, in a lot of situations, um, we it, there, there, maybe there's a different argument to be made for, say, dentistry, right? So dentistry, there are certainly people who choose not to brush their teeth. There are people who choose to drink a lot of sugary drinks. But no one chooses to have um, to be a di diabetic. Okay, so this is a graph, uh, it's not a very big graph, that shows the cost of um, medical spending depending on how, uh, how old you are. So we spend a fairly big chunk of money when you're born. And then from your teens and 20s, we don't spend that very that much, 30s, 40s. And then the closer people get to their death, that we start spending stacks of money. So the point is that we spend lots and lots of money on people who really aren't going to get a whole lot of benefit in terms of their um, lived experience. I'll give it a, a quick example of 
If you get a hip replacement that costs $20,000 and then you die two months later, was that money wasted? As an example. Okay, so again, this is um, how we the how we spend our, our money. So I would rather the idea that there's no such thing as private health care, but and I think we should also be really mindful of um, how effective our, our spending is. And the, the, that is the... That's the counter argument to public spending is that when we're all paying for it, we have to decide whether or not it's worthwhile. Whereas if an individual is saying, no, I'm willing, I want to live, I want to pay money, I want to pay my money so that I can, I can you know, keep living for another six weeks or however long, so that should be their choice. Okay, so this is a barium, um, a barium isotope that shows up on a x-ray and we can use this to, to see people swallowing. And so that you can do this to find where, if there's a blockage. So there's a blockage here and we can... Um, so when the person swallows, we can find out where there's the problem. Because it shows up on the x-ray. Now, I'll, I'll provide a link if you want to watch that again later. Um, okay. So I thought this was just funny. This was, please do not use endoscope. Uh, so endoscopes are things that go up your rear end. And um, they use this to take like um, biopsy samples. They take some tissue that they can test to see if you have cancer. And they said, please don't use this equipment to get into the machine to steal um, snacks, which I just thought was funny. Okay, uh, there are my links that I have here. So let's go through the mega thread. Uh, until we run out of time, we have 15 minutes. Okay, so we're talking about cost, yeah, so in Australia, most OECD countries, there's um, state funded medicine. This has been talking about hip replacements cost a lot of money. That same amount of money could be used to prevent, say, 100 to 200 deaths uh, if we were willing to spend it outside of Australia, if we were willing to help people in developing countries. Um, so this is where we spend most of our money is spent on right in the end of life and in this conversations on 702 they talk to a palliative care doctor so a doctor who works with people who are weeks from from dying and he talks about how he thinks we should um, change our funding of palliative care uh, so this has been talking about animal testing i think i definitely talk about this one and the other one the th thing no one tells you when you say, hey, I'm going to go and study biology is that you have to kill a lot of mice. Um, so animal testing is the foundation of all biomedical research. Um, but before we used to do that, we had people like Jenner when he was working on um, vaccines that he tested on children. So, you know, I look, I'll, I'll leave it for you to make the decision whether or not you think that testing on children is better than testing on mice. Um, so here I have just a bunch of innovations. Okay, what have we got? Uh, this is a big link of innovations, um, none of which are exciting enough for me to have them individually. That's fine. And a couple of years old. Uh, oh, okay. This is a good one. Theranos. Okay, so Theranos is a company that they said, you know, all those blood tests that people have to do when they get old, they've got to take a lot of blood. Instead, what Theranos said is that you can instead take one drop of blood and put it in something the size of a photocopier and it will do all of your blood tests for you. And the the founder of um, Theranos was Elizabeth Holmes, and they, you know, people were calling her the Steve Jobs. She actually tried to really um, emulate Steve Jobs. She was black turtleneck like Steve Jobs, for instance. And um, she was the big thing. And I remember my friends, because a lot of my friends are in science, that they just they just couldn't understand how it works. So like I don't get how they could possibly be taking enough. Um, they're not taking enough blood to be able to do enough uh, to do an accurate test. I don't understand it. And this is the sort of thing where my wife, who's not in your shot and will probably never watch this video, she'd say, "Luke, why do you have to be such a downer? Why can't you just be excited? You know, why can't you just you know try and be optimistic and positive about these sorts of things?"
things. And it wasn't me making these claims because I'm not a, a chemist. I don't know. What, you know, I'm not a microbiologist. I don't know what's going on here. The point is that she was just banking it all up, right? She was um, she was just lying to investors that all of the tests that she was doing, um, she was taking um, taking much larger samples, and then she was not actually using the machine. She had a lab out the back where everyone was doing all of their testing. Anyway, um, I don't know if she's in. I mean, last I heard, she was definitely in jail. I don't. I mean, rich people don't go to jail, but uh, when you rip off rich people, maybe you do. Um, Oh, Elizabeth Maybe not sentenced. Lucas, the chairman, but this resulted in Avi resigning um. after he felt that his advice fell on deaf ears. Elizabeth had the board wrapped around her finger. She was a master manipulator. She spoke in a low baritone voice in order to be taken more seriously. The, the question was... Prosecutors filed a third um, superseding indictment. People that you know what you're doing. It's about finding people who believe in you. Because the worst possible thing in the world is to have someone who doesn't believe in you backing you because that's not going to result in a good situation on occasion she forgot to put on the voice and was caught using a natural voice before realizing and dropping several tones no it hasn't well if i use traditional words to describe i it, am going to say that it's still not decided as of the time of me recording um, how how much trouble she's going to be um after the company moved to a prime location in Okay. Yes, yeah, so and just more innovations. Um, I try every year to try and collect um, some innovations, but you know, the, the things that are really exciting to talk about only come up every couple of years. So, um, so things like, you know, bionic aspirin, where you can, uh, the, the aspirin can be sp distributed throughout your body regularly. Like even things like IUDs are pretty, um, so that's, Um, that, I mean, there's something to be said that for starters that, um, women's health, it generally gets a lot less recognition than men's health. There's differences. I think I talk about this in a 99% invisible episode, uh, where they talk about how, uh, like they talk about it in two different episodes. They talk about it in one called invisible women, which is just talks about how, um, women aren't often considered in design. Um, Uh, it talks about how like um, crash dummies, there's no female crash test dummy. So women are far more likely to be injured in an accident than men, be partly because there's the design doesn't consider uh, women. Um, but they also have one on the pill. And the pill is probably um, the most commonly taken medication in the world. And that a lot of the considerations where they also talk about with testing, that testing usually tests on men. Uh, most medical treatments test on men because of the fact that it's more, it's easier to get consistent results because there's not this variation over the course of the month that we have for women. Um, but looking at IUDs, which definitely comes more into um, biomedical innovations, that um, IUDs have a real advantage that they require, rather than bathing your entire body in a chemical, what you can instead do is just locally release, um, uh, in the case of, of chemicals, that some of them aren't, aren't chemical based, but if they're, if they are, rather than releasing it, that they, um, it just affects the local area rather than having to, um, to bathe your entire body with chemicals. So that's the sort of idea when they're talking about that electronic aspirin is the idea is rather than bathing your entire body in chemicals, you can just release it to a localized area and um, that's that advantage. Uh, okay, another area and this, oh no, we're still doing okay. So bioethics of DNA, so 
um, DNA testing, which again we're getting outside of it, maybe the necessarily the area of um, biomedical innovations, but being able to take um, large scale DNA testing is is a very new thing. So twenty years ago, that was well, it was something called the Human Genome Project. And it cost $3 billion and took a long time to sequence a genome. These days, we can do, we can sequence a genome for about $1,000. Now, that's the idea is that it always costs a lot of money to do something the first time around. Now, because of engineering innovations that we can sequence DNA much faster, what we now have a real risk is that people will be turned down for life insurance claims because their DNA um, reveals that they have a... Um, congenital birth defect that they might have a marker on a on one of their genes that's you know makes them a, a bigger liability and life insurance is one thing but maybe medical insurance where especially in america where everyone has to individually get medical insurance it's not divided across the population could be a real problem where people who were say diabetic or you know have a, a predisposition for a bigger illness have to spend much much more money be, just through no fault of their own through the luck of the draw Okay, so um, genetic policing, this looked at the case study and I use this because we have the quote from um, Justice Michael Kirby, who he was the judge in charge of this and he talked about how we have to be careful about um, I don't know how to spell Stashi. Um, so I turn. I did used to have his quote. Maybe I still have his quote here. Okay. Um, so anyway, this, the, here's the story. So in year two, it, in the year of April two thousand, um, the entire male population of New South Wales was asked to volunteer to give their DNA to, to find a rapist. Now, We War is not very big. We War is mostly famous for Daft Punk. All right. Um, hmm. I'm surprised that when I looked up, it didn't show Daft Punk without me having to type it in there. Oh, there we go. Daft Punk. Anyway, it is not a big city. Um, but We War what's his population, 2,000. So something like 700 men were asked to come and give their DNA. And the idea was that um, you didn't have to give your DNA if you didn't want to. They weren't forcing anyone. But there was an idea where if 600 and 650 guys all come and give up, give their DNA, and 50, so a woman was raped. That was why they were, they were trying to find this. That if the 50 people who don't provide their DNA, well, they're going to be higher on that suspect list. And what's more is because a lot of those people in the town of Wewa are related, you can use DNA to actually um, indict siblings, right? So if you commit a crime, they can get DNA off you. They can ask you to give your DNA or they can pick up a coffee cup that you threw away. Or what they can do is they can go and ask your cousin. They can knock on the door and say, hey, look, we're trying to find this criminal. Um, we think it might be you know, your distant cousin. Would you mind giving a, a sample? And they only have to find one cousin who says yes. And then they can use that as a, a good enough uh, justification to arrest you and then um, you know, look for further evidence with, with a warrant. Okay, so... <clears throat> Um, yeah, Kirby said that this was a concerning precedent that we really don't want to be going down this uh, this path. Okay, um, so we can use in life insurance. This is the the Kirby quotes. Um, yeah, so whenever and whenever you get like the twenty three and Me uh, test, you give your information to the FBI right uh, indirectly because that's part of the terms and conditions that you sign is that because 23andMe operates out of the United States or it's an American company, that they will hand over all of their data. Um, and so that's some articles on that. Um, 
Yeah, so the idea here is just what I said, that they can, the cops, if they have a record of your cousin, they can be used to implicate you. Now, a lot of people would say if you don't do anything wrong, you have nothing to fear, but um, if you ever talk to someone who's lived in a police state, like in um, you know, a former Soviet country or in, say, like the Middle East or something like that, I don't want to be too specific on the internet, but um, there's definitely cases to be said that this is how bad governments stay in place. So it's fine where you have a government that you mostly think is capable and mostly competent and mostly and not corrupt. But once those things not stop being true, it's very hard to put the genie back in the bottle. Okay, um, so we talked about 3D printing, stacks of stuff on 3D printing here that we can print 3D organs and 3D print organs, not 3D organs, all organs are 3D. Um, I've got the stethoscope there. I'm really just a, a smorgasbord of links. Yeah, so we can 3D print um, total artificial heart. That's been 3D printed. We can print organs. So it doesn't seem to be plastic. About two years um, ago, we were approached by a group of surgeons and... So that's valves. This is a podcast on the stethoscope. Um, IVF. IVF is another consideration that people tend not to think about when they think about um, biomedical innovations. Now, when the first, um, I think I'm about the same age as the first IVF babies. So let's say they're about 40, something like that. That 40 years ago, people really said it was playing God. Whereas now that oh, you can't throw a rock without, hearing, without finding someone who's um, needed IVF to conceive. Um, certainly in my social circle, most people I know who um, needed IVF to conceive. Um, and I imagine a, a, a large number of my students that I teach are, are probably it's more and more the case. Um, but once upon a time, that was strongly opposed because uh, it was seen as playing God. So we have distance surgery. So you can the doctor can operate on a robot and then the robot mirrors what what the doctor does here so um yeah but the the article goes and tells the story i have a, a video on my youtube channel that also includes this link um yeah uh, i the student i taught was had a parent who was a surgeon and she he said quoting her that pretty much all surgery will be robotic in 10 years so, I mean, by 2030 sort of thing, um, all, all surgery will be rob robotic. Uh, an interesting and fun idea is the idea that um, we worry about things like self-driving cars that could be hacked. And so you could get a ransom that says, transfer us this money or otherwise we're going to drive your car into a wall. Or um, even more fun is give us this money or otherwise we're going to turn off your heart. Um, you're going to turn off your pacemaker or your artificial heart or something like that. And I have seen videos of people complaining about uh, implants gone wrong where someone, they had a their device start beeping and they couldn't afford to fly back to Japan to get the beeping removed. But effectively, they just had a beep every 30 seconds or so for years. Um, Anyway, um, look, can't find it at the moment. If I could, I would put it in the link. If someone reminds me, if someone types in the Facebook, I will, um, I'll look it up later. Okay, uh, endoscopes and distance surgery. These are the two videos that I mentioned, right at the specific Doctors section. Desperately needed a way to see into their um, so they're linked to YouTube. Uh, price gouging. So there's this guy called, um, I think it was Martin Shkreli. Um, the guy who bought the Wu-Tang album, he got a real punchable face, this dude. Um, he bought a patent for a drug uh, that people depended on. At the time, it cost $17 per tablet, and he thought that wasn't enough. And it was a 60-year-old tablet, and he said, you know what, they're not paying enough for this tablet. I think it should be $750 per tablet. 
Uh, the patent for EpiPens went from being $100 to $600. Um, now, the, the patent, they used to be $100 until the company that was competing with EpiPen went out of business. They had um, a couple of problems where people misused them and people died, and they went out of business. And then once they went out of business, EpiPen was able to, I don't know what you call it when you multiply something by six times, not triple, but triple then double, and so six times their price. And that you can produce this a competing product, an open source product, was made for $10. Um, now, obviously, the Epi engineers who developed the EpiPen, they deserve to get paid, um, but there, perhaps there should be some limitation. And uh, in 99% Invisible, they have an episode we're talking about the cost of medical treatments. It's not really an engineering thing, but there are some problems in the US law where they had specialty funding that could be set for medications that were life-saving that weren't really cost-effective, but um, they had then secondary problems. Okay, um, no, if someone again, if someone reminds me, I'll post the link on Facebook and I'll, I'll find it on 99% Invisible. Okay, uh, okay, oh, this one's a good one. This is CRISPR. Now, CRISPR is the biggest technology in biomedical innovation. I would say, again, it's it's a funny one where it's like, is it really just molecular biology rather than um, engineering? But you need engineers to be able to put together the technology. And CRISPR is probably the biggest thing in medicine. I mean, we're now maybe moved past CRISPR being the biggest thing in the world, but it's, CRISPR is a pretty big deal. And... Um, there were two different teams. There was an East Coast and a West Coast team uh, who both wanted the patent for probably the biggest technology of the decade. Um, so who, I think it was the dude who won it. Um, who won the CRISPR patent? Okay. So I think it was Jennifer Dudna um, who got it. Yeah, UC Berkeley. Uh, so the West Coast team did in fact win the patent. Um, and I think she got the Nobel Prize. Um, in chemistry. So there you go. Um, So yeah, uh, but that was hotly contested because it's you know probably the most valuable thing in medicine at the moment. Uh, this one is just a catalyst video which we've talked about previously in, on the Zoom and I was set for homework. Okay, uh, with that, and that's right on time. So there we go. Um, hopefully that was worthwhile. Like I said, this video is I think probably a better version of what I just did, but um, maybe there'll be overlap. Overlap is not bad. Sometimes hearing things twice is good for reinforcing uh, what you've done. Okay, um, I I won't be. I don't think I see a class tomorrow. I don't have year elevens tomorrow, so I see you Friday. In the meantime, work on your report, and I'll be setting more tasks as I mentioned earlier um, on Friday.